Welcome to Pets in Paradise TV, the show that explores the relationship between humans and animals in one of the most beautiful places on Earth, Hawaii. Here's what's coming up in the next half hour. We'll learn about the pit bull and why they don't deserve the bad rap they get. They historically are extremely good family dogs. Then, what to do if your dog gets bitten by a bug? We do see centipede bites, scorpion bites, um, even certain spider bites like brown recluse spiders. It's pretty hard to tell what the bite is or what caused the bite when you look at it. It happens more often than you think. Find out why Dalmatians are known as firefighter dogs. Plus, we'll witness how one lucky rooster gets a second chance in life. He either had to be put down or get his legs fixed up. It's all ahead on Pets in Paradise TV. With muscular, stocky frames, large heads, and what can sometimes be a fierce-looking face, pit bulls have a reputation of being the tough and sometimes bad guy in the canine world. But it wasn't always that way. They historically are extremely good family dogs. They are loving, they're devoted, they're intelligent, um, they're very protective of their family and even children. Who can deny the looks of a bull breed of any kind? They're the take no flack, I'm in charge, the world belongs to me, thanks for coming, line of dogs. It's a breed with a dark past. A cross between a bulldog and a terrier, pit bulls were initially bred to fight. The pups were used for blood sports like bull and bear baiting, then later in dog fights, but that was ages ago. Since the early 1900s, pit bulls have been welcomed into homes as family dogs. They look scary, but they're actually really, really friendly. Pit bulls are important to me because it's my family pet, and they love my children, and um, it's not the breed, it's how you bring them up. Just like humans, pit bulls, and any dog for that matter, need love and affection from an early age. And like humans, must be taught right from wrong. Any dog can be trained or raised in an unsuitable environment that can bring out the worst in them. So pit bulls, it doesn't matter what the breed. You got little cocker spaniels that can be raised as killers. It's their environment and the people that are training them to do that job. The love for pit bulls has grown so great over the years that some enthusiasts started their own dog breeder club called the American Bully Kennel Club, or ABKC. It came up with the standards of what makes an ideal pit bull. When I'm judging, what I look for is nice size headpieces, bullier bodies, they tend to be a little bit wider, good top line, good angulation, good tails, good bite. Dogs have to be socialized. If a dog is human aggressive, they will be automatically excused. Not only have pit bull lovers started their own club, but some have started their own breeds of so-called bullies. Bully is shorter, wider, Compactor dogs with bigger head, great structure, great muscle tone. While they're bred to look mean, these dogs are nurtured and raised to be friendly. However, some people can't get past the looks or the dog's reputation and have actually tried to ban the dogs. They want to take away our pit bulls from the island. There is a bill, Bill SB 79, which is under trying to ban the pit bull breed from Hawaii. We love pit bulls. That measure didn't get far and never became law. Not only was there a lot of opposition from the public, getting rid of the dog breed out of Hawaii entirely would have been incredibly difficult. As a police officer, if we don't have the training to distinguish the breeds, it would be unfair to take someone's family member or someone's pet and maybe they don't have one ounce of blood of pit bull. The other thing giving pit bulls a bad rap is their bite. Some people believe if you get close to one, the dog will start biting, its jaw locking shut so you can't get away. This is completely false. Not all pit bulls are, are, are raised to be fighting dogs, aggression. Our dogs are raised around our kids, our family. Our three-year-old daughter could basically walk Rockefeller to the kennel. So while they may purposely look like mean, rough, tough guys, 
behind their outward appearance, pit bulls are just like any other dog. They just want to love and be loved in return. It seems only natural to give a cat milk, but you often hear that it's not a good idea. So which is it? We'll let you know in just a minute. Should cats have milk? The answer is probably not. The problem is lactose. Just as many humans are lactose intolerant, many cats are too. It seems that kittens can tolerate lactose just fine, but not as much as they grow older. Milk can cause upset stomachs, vomiting, and diarrhea. What cats do need, though, is plenty of water to prevent urinary and bladder infections. Playing outdoors is something all dogs love to do. From running in the grass to just sniffing around, it's what makes dogs, well, dogs. But this love of nature can put dogs at risk. The outdoors is home to many creatures, including insects. In this episode, we look at insect bites, how you can treat them, and the serious symptoms you need to look out for. Bee stings, um, the most common things we'll see is the dogs will want to eat a bee, so they typically will have a swollen face. You know, they'll look like their eyes are all puffy and stuff. Around, the areas around their, their face swell up. Um, and that's the usual symptoms of a bee sting. First thing you should know about insect bites is that they are common. And as you might guess, some types of bites are more likely to happen than others. Swelling is just one of the reactions a dog can have after being bitten or stung. Many symptoms show up within minutes of the bite. However, others could take a full day or sometimes even longer to develop. This is Veda, and one day at the park, she got bit by either a bee or a centipede. We took her to the vet right away because she's got all swollen and got welts all over her. They gave her a couple of shots, Benadryl and something else, and she was pretty much better in an hour. Other types of insects um, can also cause problems. We do see centipede bites, scorpion bites, um, even certain spider bites like brown recluse spiders. Um, it's pretty hard to tell what the bite is or what caused the bite when you look at it, but sometimes the other insect bites will cause a redness, even turning blue kind of looking color would tell us that perhaps the skin is starting to necrose or die because some of the toxins that some of these insects when they bite can cause death of the tissue and that can cause um, a chunk of skin to actually turn blue and actually um, die. And so we have to be very aggressive about treating some of those. Because of the wide range of effects insect bites can have, it's important to know how to deal with this pesky situation and how to treat your pet properly. In some cases, the reactions may be so bad surgery is needed. Other times, the symptoms are mild, only causing inflammation and some pain. We treat them with pain medications. We usually will also put the, the dogs on antibiotics for that. If your dog does get bit or stung and you don't see any severe reactions, here are some tips to help your pet feel better. For bug stings, apply aloe vera gel to help soothe pain and burning. For bumps and sores, gently apply a mix of baking soda and water several times a day until the bumps go away. In more severe cases, doctors suggest you use over-the-counter Benadryl. Breathing issues are fairly rare, although you will also see vomiting because when the release of histamine from the insect bite and the reaction stimulates the vomiting centers of the brain. Now you have a few tips to minimize the pain the next time your pup has an unfriendly encounter with a bug. And if you're ever unsure what to do, don't hesitate to call your vet. This is Hoku. He's a great runner. He loves to swim, and he's got a beautiful brindle-colored coat. Can you guess what breed he is? We'll tell you right after this. Could you guess Hoku's breed? If you guess that Hoku is a mixed breed, you're right. He's actually a mix of three different breeds, Labrador Retriever, Greyhound, and American Pit Terrier. That accounts for his love of swimming, running, and his unique markings. Here's another dog that has very familiar markings. Today on It's All About the Breed, it's all about the Dalmatian. The first question most people have about the Dalmatian is, 
Why is it always seen in fire trucks? Then the following question, why does it have those spots? Let's start with the fire truck. Dalmatians were first used to clear the way for horses that pulled the fire wagons. They were great with horses and ran alongside them for miles or ran under the carriage of the wagon. After horses were no longer used, Dalmatians were kept as mascots, a role that has stuck with them to this day. They're still considered the firehouse dog. Dalmatians in history date back to the 1700s. Although they were originally bred in England, they originated in Croatia, in a historic district called Dalmatia, where they were used as companions to nomadic tribes and as guard dogs. That characteristic follows them to this day. Dalmatians are still used as guard dogs and are very loyal to their owners and somewhat distrustful of strangers. We're all familiar as well with the Dalmatian as the star of popular books and movies. Dalmatians are fairly large dogs that grow to about 55 pounds, both male and female. Their lifespan is about 10 to 12 years. Litters can be big. It's not unusual for a Dalmatian to have up to 15 pups in a litter. Puppies are born without spots, but they start showing at about three weeks, and after a month, they've usually got all their spots. The spots, by the way, are usually black or brown, and their coats are usually white, although they sometimes come in blue, brindle, or tricolored. Their coats are short, fine, and smooth. They tend to shed all year long, and their hair is stiff and often hard to get out of carpet, upholstery, and clothing. They need to be brushed at least weekly to reduce the amount of shedding. A good feature about their coat, though, is that they don't have that dog smell. That's because their coats have only a minimal amount of oil, which is what causes the dog smell. As for health issues, Dalmatians are a relatively healthy breed, but do have a tendency toward deafness, allergies, and urinary stones. Hip dysplasia isn't much of a problem with Dalmatians. Thinking back to when Dalmatians were used to run alongside fire wagons, they possessed, and still do, a high level of energy and stamina. That means they need lots of exercise. As puppies, they are very energetic and need lots of leadership and exercise. It's believed that up to half of the people who adopt Dalmatian puppies don't keep them past the first year. It's so much work. But those who stick it out through those hyperactive days end up with a very loyal, obedient, and trustworthy dog. And now you know all about the Dalmatian. <laughs> You always hear that you shouldn't give a dog a chicken bone. Is that really something to worry about, or is it an old wives' tale? We'll let you know right after this. It turns out that chicken bones are bad for your dog. But it's not just chicken bones. The Food and Drug Administration says there are 10 reasons you shouldn't give any bones to dogs, including broken teeth, mouth and tongue injuries, bones getting stuck in the esophagus, the stomach or intestines, and causing internal bleeding. The FDA says it's a better idea to buy chew toys and play it safe. Hawaii has a significant feral chicken population, and one of those chickens is a rooster named Bruce. Unfortunately, Bruce got into some trouble and hurt his leg. But thanks to some human and canine help, Bruce turns out to be one lucky rooster. In this story, we'll follow Bruce through his diagnosis, his surgery, and his recovery. Two weeks ago or so, Daisy, who lives here at the nursery, she's a small pit bull mix, she found Bruce down in the road in the bushes and turns out he has a broken leg. It's not clear how Bruce received the injury to his leg. A lot of times, feral chickens are hit by cars, the victims of dog attacks, or by people trying to kill them. So at first, he could barely stand up. Um, we took him to the vet because we weren't sure what to do, and she told us that he either had to be put down or get his legs fixed up or else he wouldn't be able to really limp around at all. And since he's a feral chicken, we thought, well, we'll see what happens, see if he gets better. He did get a little better, but his leg isn't gonna be better. Wanting to do the right thing, Emily and her friends sought help from a local bird group and collected donations. Enough money to get the surgery that Bruce needed to fix his leg and be able to survive. 
Which leads us to Dr. Walsh at Feather and Fur, an animal hospital in Kailua, Oahu, that specializes in training birds of all kinds. So today we'll be working on Bruce, who's a wild chicken that was uh, hanging out at an orchard and was rescued by one of the people who worked there and had known him for most of his life. Uh, he apparently got shot by a pellet and had his leg broken. So we're going to try and fix his leg today. All right, we're gonna give Bruce some butorphanol and midazolam to help cover for pain and make him less anxious for the procedure. So we're gonna inject this into his pectoral muscle. So um, Bruce is getting a little sleepy, he's closing his eyes, starting to bend his knees down a little bit, getting to a hunch. Um, so pretty soon he should be fully sedated and we'll start surgery. Birds are much more delicate than mammals, so when it comes to anesthesia, it's more difficult to sedate birds and different methods and drugs are used than are used with mammals. Sadly, even with the best anesthetics, they often don't make it through surgery. This x-ray shows Bruce's fracture. Um, essentially, this bone piece should connect to that piece and instead it's displaced over here. It should look just like this bone right here. If you imagine this is the break, right now the two bones are sitting like this. So what we're gonna have to do is break down some of the scar tissue and try and realign the bones. But because this is an old fracture, we may, may not be successful in doing that. If we are, then we're gonna use a pin that we're gonna pass in, put inside the bone to help stabilize it and keep it in its proper position. So here we are starting with the skin incision over the fracture site and we're going to cut through the uh, muscle layers and expose the, the fracture. I'm opening the fracture site now and exposing the segments of the bone that are broken. We're finding a lot of abnormal necrotic material from where the pellet smashed the bone and shattered the bone and caused some infection and killed some of the bone tissue. That makes the surgery more difficult and gives a worse prognosis for long-term success because we have uh, infected damage fragments. With the wound now cleaned, Dr. Walsh is ready to start the drilling procedure that will provide a hole where the pin can be inserted into both parts of the fractured bone. Normally when I do this, I can easily see the end of the bone to center the pin into, but in this case, because there's so much scarring and damaged material, it's much more difficult to identify the location to put the pin. Dr. Walsh carefully makes his best guess where to drill by feeling the bone and then placing the drill in the center of the bone shaft. This pin feels nice and secure. It's moving the leg how I want it to and it feels real stable. So we're gonna go get the x-ray to verify our position and then cut the pin after that. I'm really happy with how the bone segments align because it was hard to see exactly where we were and it turns out we were exactly where we wanted to be. The bone segments are really nicely aligned so we have a good chance for a successful recovery. The delicate surgery is over, but Bruce isn't out of the woods yet. He'll be kept in a warm chamber while the sedation wears off. He'll be monitored for any signs of trouble until he wakes up and is able to stand on his own. He's starting to wake up a little bit more. He's getting more stable and more alert, so I'm happy with how he's progressing. So we're gonna just set you back down here, buddy. Keep resting. So it's the day after Bruce's surgery, and we're gonna check him out and see how he's doing today. He's holding his leg much more comfortably, so we're gonna take a look at him and see how it's looking. All right, so his incision looks pretty good. It's got some bruising like is expected, um, but the leg is holding it nice and steady in place, so we're happy with how he's doing. All right, so we can see he's still a little bit sensitive, but he's able to put some weight on his leg now, um, so we're happy with how he's progressing. And uh, hopefully, uh, if he continues to heal up, he'll be walking really well in a couple weeks and uh, be able to have increased activity in a month. A month has gone by, and Bruce is now ready for the move to his new home and family on the windward side of Oahu. Le Jardin Academy has a garden where students are taught organic farming. This beautiful garden is what Bruce will now call home and where he'll live out his life. Okay, this is a, um, actually a dog kennel. So um, it's built to keep in you know, rather large dogs. So I think uh, it should be able to hold uh, Bruce the rooster all right. And it's got some, just a netting on the top so the birds don't get in and eat his feed. So we've had Bruce since the end of July when we found him. Um, we've been taking care of him at my house and at the plant nursery I work at. He did really well. He got better from his leg surgery. But then a couple weeks ago he got an infection 
So we had to get him well again. But now finally he's set to go to his new home. Bruce has a good view of some chicks over here, so, and there's some hens over there. So, um, oh, he's getting quite excited. He, he's listening to the talk of lunch. So, um, you know, he'll, he'll just live out his, his time down here. <laughs> so I guess this is the end of the journey for me and Bruce. Hopefully he'll live here forever. This is his retirement home. So I'll just come visit him occasionally and see how he's doing. Welcome to Pets in Paradise TV. Here's what's coming up in the next half hour. We'll follow a golf course maintenance worker and see that he does more than mow the lawn. Then we'll learn how the relationship between a blind person and a seeing eye dog works. We'll discover the sport of agility for cats. Plus, you'll find out if the pit bull is the right dog for your family. It's all ahead on Pets in Paradise TV. Hi, my name is Kyle Kunisher. I'm the tennis pro here at the Honolulu Country Club. I got a nickname of Dr. Doolittle over here, so we're gonna go ahead and, and show you how I got my name. The fictional Dr. Doolittle had a gift of talking to animals, and so it is with Kyle. He also shares in the doctor's love for all animals, even those that many people think of as pests. This is Itchy over here. She's one of my favorite mongoose that I come and make sure that she gets a, a meal for her and her family. Well, I think right now she has some babies, so she eats like maybe one or two cans of this Vienna sauce. Hey, itchy boy. Mongoose were brought to Hawaii in the 1800s to help cut down on rats in the sugar plantations. But instead of catching rats, they preyed on native birds, making them an unwanted newcomer in the islands. Still in Kyle's eyes, they're a creature that needs to be cared for just like the many other unofficial residents of the golf course. This is Daphne over here. I've been taking care of her for since 1997. She's one of my favorites over here, and I always try to make sure that she's well taken care of. Unfortunately, uh, one of her eyes got infected, and um, apparently she's, she's blind in one eye, so I'm trying to nurse her, make sure that she's good, and uh, she's good to go, and hopefully she'll be okay living out here at the Honolulu Country Club. Even the animals that are known to scatter when approached by humans seem to flock to Kyle. Come on, buddies. Before he pulls out the bread, these minor birds are already circling Kyle for their daily treat. This is the mongoose call. They normally respond to this thing. Come here, buddy. Here. There you go. <laughs> then the minor birds, they, they yell and scream to let the everybody know that there's a predator around over here. But there's a baby mongoose over there. Cute, yeah? <laughs> I play here at golf every other week, sometimes every week, and you know, um, I, don't, I don't like it when I see animals suffering and all that, so I tend to take care of these guys, and plus I'm, you know, I'm, I'm one of the workers over here, so I have the privilege to come on the course and, and feed all these animals, take good care of them, and um, take them to the vet or, or anything. And that's why a lot of people tell me I'm the Dr. Doolittle over there, but I enjoy it, you know, especially when they come up to you and they respond to you and, you know, it, it's unconditional love over here. So this is um, Blackie. He's a black and white duck that I've been taking care of for almost, what, 15 years already. Loves to eat his rice. You know, animals know when, you, when you're doing good things for them, yeah? And it's a special thing. Kyle's work with the animals helps to build on the beauty of the Honolulu Country Club. Golfers get to enjoy the picturesque surroundings and watch the animals enjoy their day, too. And there's another group of animals to help here. That's Big Boy over here. Come on, Big Boy. He's not, come on. He's my favorite cat over here. Come on, boy. So I put this pink collar on him to make sure that everybody knows that this is uh, somebody's cat, but he always comes to me, and he's very friendly too, but 
Apparently not everybody gets to, to touch him. In addition to feeding the cats, Kyle works hard to round them up and get them spayed and neutered. The cats also have a job here. They keep the rats out, so they earn their keep. All right, and there you know, um, that's why they call me Dr. Doolittle over here. You might have heard that a dog will poop in only one direction. You might have even noticed this behavior with your dog when you've been out for a walk. Is that just an old wives tale or is it true? We'll find out right after this. Believe it or not, dogs do tend to poop in one direction. More specifically, they align themselves with the Earth's north-south axis. According to new research, dogs prefer to go potty when their bodies are either facing north or facing south. Most avoid facing east or west altogether. The reason for this behavior still isn't clear, but it points out that a dog is able, either consciously or subconsciously, to detect the Earth's magnetic field. They aren't the only ones that can do that. Scientists have long known that birds migrate according to the Earth's magnetic field. As for dogs, this discovery may also answer the question as to why a dog often spins around before going poo. Welcome back to Pets in Paradise TV. There are more than 500 dog breeds ranging from the world's smallest, the Chihuahua, to the mighty Great Dane. Our goal is to pick one and learn all about it in It's All About the Breed. Today, it's all about the pit bulls. It's a common misconception that the pit bull is a breed. Actually, pit bull is a term used to describe several different breeds, including the American Pit Bull Terrier, the American Staffordshire Terrier, the Staffordshire Bull Terrier, and the American Bully. Sometimes included are the American Bulldog and the Bull Terrier, both standard and miniature. The term pit bull is used to describe dogs that have similar physical characteristics, including square-shaped heads and bulky bodies. The pit bull breeds were originally a mix of bulldogs and terriers and were bred for blood sports, such as bull baiting, bear baiting, and cockfighting. The mix has incredible agility and strength. Blood sports were outlawed in England in 1835, and pit bulls were then bred mostly for hunting dogs and as family pets. Although dog fighting has continued secretly in both the U.S. and Great Britain, and some dogs are still bred for that purpose. The pit bull type dogs became synonymous with fighting and aggression, and in 1996, the San Francisco SPCA began calling them St. Francis Terriers, so people would be more likely to adopt them. In 2004, New York City's Center for Animal Care and Control started calling them New Yorkies, but that didn't work either. Pit bulls have also been singled out as a dangerous dog responsible for the majority of human deaths in cases of dog attacks. And some communities have even banned pit bull breeds, including Miami, Denver, Ontario, Canada, and Singapore. Research, however, has shown that pit bulls are getting an unfair rap. The American Veterinary Medical Association doesn't believe that pit bull breeds are as deadly and dangerous as their reputations would lead you to believe, nor does the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, which opposes bans or legislation restricting breeds. Even the White House has chimed in. In 2013, President Obama issued a statement saying that the federal government does not support breed-specific legislation. A number of myths have also surfaced as a result of their poor reputation. One is that they have locking jaws. The truth, however, is that their jaws are built the same as any dog. The locking reputation is simply the fact that pit bulls have great strength and even greater determination to not let go. Another myth is that they are aggressive toward humans. That's not the case, unless they've been purposely trained to attack humans. In general, pit bulls love people and are friendly and loyal companions. Pit bull puppies are incredibly cute, and if they're raised in a loving and disciplined manner, like any dog, they'll grow up to be great household pets. In fact, pit bulls generally don't make good guard or watchdogs because they're too friendly. In England, the United Kennel Club considers pit bulls as the perfect nanny dog for children because of their friendly nature. 
Perhaps times are changing, and these adorable puppies will have a chance to change the negative attitudes about them. And now you know all about pit bulls. <laughs> All cat owners know that when a cat meows, it wants something. A bowl of food, a simple treat, or just some loving. But when cats are alone with other cats, what do they mean when they meow? We'll find out right after this. When cats are alone with only other cats around, what do they want when they meow? Well, it's a trick question because cats don't meow when they're not around humans. It seems that the meow is learned behavior. Early on, as kittens, they find out that a meow can bring dinner or a snack or a scratch behind the ears. Then, throughout their life, they know exactly what to say or rather what to meow when they want something. Researchers have identified a number of common reasons why cats meow. They do it to greet people, to get attention, to request dinner, or to be let in or out of the house. Some cats have a different meow for each of their requests. It said seeing is believing, but for Joy, she needs to believe in her dog to see the world around her. My guide dog's name is Laika, and we've been together for three years now, since 2008. I received her from the Isle of the Pacific Guide Dogs Foundation, and they received, they purchased their dogs from Australia and New Zealand. Laika is trained to guide Joy to wherever she wants to go in a manner that's as safe as possible, avoiding any obstacles in their yeah, way. But instead of turning right that pathway, if you were to turn the straight, you would fight. When Joy wants to go to a new location, she'll contact me, we discuss where she wants to go. I'll go ahead, check out a route, establish a route, a route that's safe and feasible for Joy and her guide dog, Laika. Shirley walks with Joy to make sure Laika is taking the right path. It may take once or it may take many times before Laika can do it without Shirley being there. And aside from being Joy's leader, Laika is also a finder. Laika will find different locations for me, such as offices, stores, um, bus stops. She'll find elevators, escalators, stairs. When I'm asking her to find a door, such as when we're going to an office, I'll say, okay, locate the door, and she'll automatically stop at the first door she comes to. Laika is a beautiful, affectionate, very fun dog, and it's very difficult, that, but very important that I ignore her when we're working together. I need to make sure not to be a distraction to Laika and for her to focus on her job, which is to guide Joy. So no petting, no looking at her even, no eye contact, no touching, no hugging, no talking with her. I just have to completely ignore her while we're working. While Shirley's experience with Laika is completely hands-off, Joy's partnership with Laika is quite the opposite. Even the slightest touch or movement has a very specific meaning. There's a sensitivity that I'm feeling to the handle, and the movements that I'm feeling is all coming to the handle. So I'm moving in accordance to how my hand is feeling through the harness handle. As you saw, the handle came up a little bit, so I knew she was heading down. Now we're going straight across, and the handle is gonna drop down to indicate she's going up. So through the handle, I'm feeling what I'm doing. A relationship with a guide dog is different from a relationship with a family dog. The, um, the bonding is a little stronger and it's a little more in tune to one another, like as far as the human to the dog and the dog to the human. Well, mostly the dog can sense what it is you're feeling um, and also too, it is, you know, the human can also sense what the dog sometimes is feeling, but it's a little sharper on the dog side. The hardest part after working together for 10 years is when the dog has to retire. So at that point, I make sure that she goes to a very good home. The guide dog travel for me was safer um, because it, uh, for me, using the white cane wasn't a very good method of travel. 
I was a terrible cane traveler, so when I started using the guide dog, I became more independent. Um, it helped with my confidence working with the dog, so for me, it was a more beneficial way of travel. It'll be many years before Joy and Laika have to part ways, but for now, it's about living in the moment and exploring the world around them together. When you think of the sport of agility, running and jumping dogs usually come to mind. But roll over, Rover, there's a new player in town. Cats are taking over the agility course. Right now, they're, they do their stretches and they get ready to play. But this is more than just play. It takes practice on both the part of the pet and the owner. Cat agility is a uh, form of uh, sport that uh, your cat can participate in, a lot like a dog agility course. So how does it work? Owners help their cat through a room of obstacles. The animals get points for every obstacle they complete, and the faster they complete the course, the better the score. And it doesn't take a special breed to be good at it. Well, if you want a cat specifically to do feline agility, it can actually be just about any cat. It needs to have the personality where they feel safe in an atmosphere outside the house. Before hitting the course, it helps to get your cat out and about. Take them to the pet store or anywhere that allows pets. Exposing them to other sights and sounds can help put them at ease and strengthen your bond. Both are needed when you face the unknown obstacles of the agility course. But how do you know if your cat is ready? Today we're going to take Casper in and do a little bit of practicing and training on the agility course and see how he likes it. Has he ever done agility before? Nope. Nope. Okay, so what you want to do is you want to take him in the ring and you're going to sit down in the middle and relax and your body language is going to teach him basically what he needs to know. If they feel safe, then they'll play. If they don't feel safe, they won't respond to a toy. Getting through the course all goes back to animal instincts. Cats want to get their prey, and a little teasing from a toy can help stir those instincts. You want to pick a toy that will keep your cat's interest for a long time. Got a fickle cat? Add a bell to the toy. That will keep more of your cat's senses engaged. Keep going. Good, now keep going. And wait, good, you got him, keep going. Wait, when he stops, you stop. In shape, cats do well when it comes to agility, but cats with some extra weight are just as welcome to the course. Physical away. shape is just part of what makes a cat great at the sport of agility. Good, keep going. Well, I learned that he needs to have his attention focused or he won't chase it. And he's more distracted than the other cat by things that are going on around him. He's got a lot more work to do. So we will practice more at home. Um, my name's Rebecca and I'm here with my cat Lennox. This is his first time doing an agility course. Um, although he's done a lot of cat shows before, but never agility. The sport of agility for cats has been around since 1995 with the first competition in 2001. Since then, competitions have been held around the U.S. and Canada, with other countries showing interest as the sport grows in popularity. He's not doing so badly for the first time, but he doesn't really get the point of the obstacles. He just wants to go around them and take the easy way. <laughs> okay, this is Panther. He's one of the adoptables here at the Pet Expo. He's seven months old. He's never been in an agility ring in his life. And we're giving him now what all cats need to do before they start doing anything is the walking around time. They have to smell everything and see where they are and be comfortable. Unlike dogs, which are pack animals and are first drawn to their pack master when they get to a new place, cats are the opposite. They seek to discover the environment first which can make it difficult for an owner to lead their cat through the course. Come on. Come on, Dad. Okay, now. Good boy. Good boy. Come on. Through, through, through. 
Now that he's become more familiar with his surroundings, let's see how Panther does. Oh my God, he's doing great. Good boy. Good boy. You can hear her saying it, good boy, over and over. That's not just out of joy. Repeating phrases can help a cat through the course. It helps your cat know if they're doing the right thing. Saying through, jump, or around can help your cat know what to do. Good boy, come on. Up. This is the weave, weave poles while they're little weave jumps. Come on. Oh my God, he might do a clean run on his first time. That'd be pretty remarkable. Come on. Okay, come on, Panther. Come on, Panther. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on Panther. Come on. Come on, Panther. Come on, Panther. Yay! A clean run on his first time around. I can't believe it. Panther was the exception here. For many cats, it takes a lot of work with their owner to get through the course in a clean run. But with lots of practice and an interesting toy, any cat can become an agility course champion.